Welcome back. Enjoy those locally grown strawberries. The industry here in Florida is in trouble. Just today comes news that O'Brien Family Farms is looking for a buyer. The company filed for bankruptcy in February. Part of the problem, cheaper labor in Mexico. Part of the problem is a lack of migrant labor here in the U.S. And as Adam Cellini just reminded us, it's back-breaking work most Americans just won't do. So are robots really the answer? And joining us for more is Paul Bissett, the chief operating officer at Harvest Crew Robotics, Keith Fitzgerald, the political science professor at New College, and Michael Snipes, the economics instructor at USF Sarasota Manatee. So, um, Paul, let me start with you. You were explaining it to me before the show because we hear so often in this terrible debate we always have about immigration uh, that immigrants are taking American jobs. If you took migrant workers off the, the table here, do you have enough American workers to pick the strawberries? at the farms that you work at? No, just no. Right now, I mean, if you look at the Pew Research between 2009 and 2013, the country actually lost about a million migrant workers. They weren't coming into the country, they were actually leaving. Um, that's introduced a big challenge for the whole fruits and vegetables industry, which is a $20 billion industry. Let me just ask you, did this start when President Trump came into office and no. he talked tough? No. Did, did, when did you start having this issue? Um, when, did, when did the strawberry farmers themselves? It's been going on for years. We've had increasing labor prices, which represent about 30 to 40 percent of the cost to these farms uh, going on for years. And the, the challenge is, is that the, the demographics in Mexico itself has been changing. Much like the demographics in the U.S., uh, they've gotten smaller and smaller groups of younger people that are typically the migrants. Um, add to that, the economic opportunities in Mexico have actually been increasing at a faster rate than, than in the United States. The O'Briens seem to be saying that NAFTA uh, also plays a role here, that um, labor costs are cheaper in Mexico and that domestic U.S. producers have to pay higher wages, other fees that make them less competitive than Mexico growers. And that's true. Uh, and in the O'Brien's case, what, what companies, international companies, have been able to do is set up farming operations in Mexico. And that's allowed them to leverage those cheaper labor costs and the O'Briens were a smaller farm and didn't have those resources, so they had to go out and acquire either the local populations to harvest their fruit uh, or H-2A visas, which are another significant source Keith, of labor. Keith, we, we, we brought you here today because there really is the politics of farming. As I said at the outset, so often we hear that migrant workers or illegal or undocumented workers are taking American jobs. In this case, it's clearly not true, but that's not what you hear out of Washington. Well, I, I've always found this to be really perplexing at a certain level that there's this drumbeat of information about how we're being overrun with immigrants from Mexico, legal and not legal. And the fact of the matter is it's just not true. Numbers, as, as uh, the other guest said here, are, have actually been going down pretty consistently. Uh, some of it is because the uh, Mexican economy is improving and they, people want to stay home and uh, the numbers are just down. So uh, it, it, we have uh, labor shortages in various different labor markets. That's not a surprising thing. Uh, but this picture that we're being overrun by this cheap labor, it's just not really true across the United States. Michael, can you put this in, an, in the context of, of what you do in terms of economics? How important is this industry to f not only Florida, but to other areas of the United States. Well, agriculture in Florida, I mean, it's it's the second biggest industry in Florida, so it's hugely important. Next to tourism. Next to mention. tourism, right. So it's hugely important to the Florida economy, but really this, this whole discussion really kind of points to something that's going to become really important really quickly for not just the United States, but for the world as automation starts to increase and take jobs that were formerly held by people what do we do with these people? We have, we have to give them something to do. But l let me ask you this while we have a minute left here. Automation is taking a lot of jobs. As Jerry Springer, who was once on this show, pointed out, there used to be men and women standing behind these cameras. They're robotic at this point. But when we're talking about robotics in the strawberry picking industry, it's because you, you don't have the men and women out there that you, that you used to depend on. Right. I mean, it's, it's not a... a 
people replacement, it's the savior of the industry. If we don't do something about harvesting, then you're going to have more farms like the O'Briens go out of business, and the fruits and vegetables industry will be different. It'll be a luxury good, at least locally produced fruits and vegetables. And far more expo expensive. Far more expensive. All right, we are just getting warmed up, and we'll have much more on the strawberry industry right after we check the first alert weather, so stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking about the struggling strawberry industry here in Florida. And joining us for more are Paul Bissett, the Chief Operating Officer at Harvest Crew Robotics, Keith Fitzgerald, a political science professor at New College, and Michael Snipes, an economics instructor at USF, Sarasota, and Manatee. There's a lot I want to get to, Paul. But first, when we were talking about the O'Brien family and the demise of, of their ability to stay in business, Along with stories that we have been hearing for the last couple of years at strawberry farms all across the Sun Coast, all the way into Polk County, is that you have situations that you do not have enough workers to pick the crop, and there are there's fruit that's going bad out there. Is that part of the problem that we're talking about with this latest story with the O'Brien farms? It's part of it. Um, you got to recognize a farmer has to make a bet months in advance of how much they're going to plant how they're going to support that, those crops. And if they bet wrong on having the labor to bring those crops in, that money's gone. It's wasted. And so um, people bet smaller if they have a large risk in being able to get the fruit off the ground. Betting smaller means less profits, less margins, higher fixed cost is part of that, and it's a negative feedback spiral if you're always planning less and less and less because you can't get the labor. I bet when I look at viewer comments tomorrow morning that there will be a lot of them that say just pay higher wages and you will get American workers to do this. Right now, we're paying 25 bucks an hour. We don't have enough workers. 25 bucks an hour in terms of labor costs, but not necessarily. No, no, to, to the domestic labor that we're doing. H2A is a bit different. But because of that surety issue that I was telling you, about 80% of our labor supply, at least at, at Wish Farms, which is the company that was founded by um, Gary's family, Gary Wishnatsky was the founder of Harvest Crew Robotics. Um, I think their, their percentage was 80% of their labor was H2A because of the surety issue. It costs them more. They got to pay for housing. They got to pay for travel. There's overhead costs on bringing those people in. But they couldn't get enough domestic workforce even at those price points. I had at least one person, Keith, come up to me today and say, well, this is, this is NAFTA because the labor costs are less in Mexico. Also, the health and safety requirements are less in Mexico. That goes to government over-regulation. Take that on. Well, I think I would, I, there is something to that. Uh, I would say more than just NAFTA, though, it has to do with globalization generally. Uh, labor markets are crossing boundaries. Um, and when the labor costs go up, it means that point where it makes sense to in invest in uh, some kind of technical solution becomes closer. They might have to go in debt to do this, but suddenly they're saying, I can have a, a robot here and it will be secure. So it's not just NAFTA, it's the way the entire uh, global economy is working. And it causes uh, inequality and that causes political unrest. So. Uh, it's a big picture item, and I think that you know you see uh, something going on on a global basis, tied up in this story. Uh, Michael, has if you could again look at this as a economic, uh, you know, arena here. That how has the the uh, the agricultural economy in the United States been impacted by these very issues? Let's say over the the last ten years. Well, th this is something that's an issue all across the country. Anytime that you're going to have large agricultural areas, you're going to need people to do the work, and it, it, it is like the story said, it is backbreaking work. It's a very difficult work, and it it might be the case that we're paying twenty five dollars an hour on average but there's still not going to be a lot of people who are going to be able to, or willing or able to do that kind of backbreaking work for that long, even if the pay is, is good at $25. This is hour. hard stuff. I mean, you know, I was relating to a, a story uh, of a guy I know who, was, who owned a chain of car washes and told me straight out he hires undocumented workers because he can't get a 17-year-old son to do, do this kind of work. Uh, Paul. What is at stake here, not in terms of just the, uh, the ability of a company like yours to stay in operation here, but 
if we don't fix this problem either through automation or robotics or, or getting enough workers, what will happen to the availability of strawberries and the cost for Florida families? Personally, I believe uh, strawberries will become, at least locally grown strawberries, will become a luxury good. If it costs more and more to harvest them, those prices are going to be reflected in the consumer prices. And that gets into a, a food security problem. There are, are food pyramids today that are being built that say we need to eat more fruits and vegetables, especially fresh fruits and vegetables. And if those get more and more expensive, some people are just not going to be able to afford them. And we have seen this discussion, uh, including in the citrus industry around here. We have fewer and fewer citrus groves in our neck of the woods here in Florida, and a lot of that land is being sell sold off to developers, and new homes go up, but our supply of the f of food is down. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think that's the idea of food security is a really interesting one, because the framers of NAFTA were, and, and this was Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, had a kind of framework of thinking global markets are always a good thing. Free trade is always a good thing. But there are hidden traps in it that we really didn't think about. Nobody would think about that there might be certain kinds of uh, commodities that you just cannot produce locally well, then, in a global market. Then let me ask you, where are we at? In, I, I, I know that the president has talked about getting out of NAFTA. Um, I, I have not heard that kind of discussion really from Congress right now. C Congress is not doing much of anything. Well, one of the things you have to think about with NAFTA is that it, it may on balance uh, be a good thing for the entire United States economy, but if the benefits that accrue from the economy growing go to a small number of people, everyone else is not going to feel like that's a very good thing. So in Washington, they're listening to the big shots who are doing okay under NAFTA. They're not really paying attention to everyone else, and that's part of why there's a lot of backlash against Washington. Uh, Michael, has NAFTA, when it gets down to it, been good for the United States? Uh, putting me on the spot there, right? Um, generally speaking, yes, it, ha it has, be has benefited. Uh, the United States, and it's, it's benefited all the members that were that were all the countries that were members of it. But it, it, it is something that you do need to take into account that there are these tr these potential traps that maybe we don't necessarily think far enough ahead that can come up and snag us. All right, so time for final thoughts. And Paul, you know, wrap this up from your perspective. What do you want people to to walk away from this conversation, which has ab absolutely been fascinating? Uh, if we don't do something with technology to solve this labor problem, people are going to have less fruits and vegetables, fresh. You're saying you're not going to solve this problem in terms of get, finding some way in The demographics aren't there. Labor. And even if we paid them $50 an hour, I'm not sure the demographics would still support people coming out to work. Yeah. We'd be able to bring in more H-2A visa workers. We could afford to do that. But again, the, the amount, it's a supply and demand thing. If you raise the prices, there's less supply. Supply. Keith, is the politics of this changing? Oh, I, absolutely, it's changing. And um, I think that it is tied to um, discontent with the difference between the interests of the elites and the interests of average people in ways that are shaking up the whole party structure. Uh, I both think parties. Both parties. Some people have gone to Trump because they don't, uh, Republicans and Democrats, because they don't feel like their interests are being looked at. I think that this party, party uh, on the left, there may be, you know, Bernie coming up again, because you have a sector of the population that's just not going to benefit a whole lot uh, from this happening. And, and Michael, in terms of, of the economy here, if we don't find a way to fix this, uh, what kind of impact can this potentially have on the American economy? Uh, on the American economy, it, it could be potentially a pretty big impact. And if we want to focus, you know, a little bit more narrow on Florida, you know, as I mentioned, agriculture is hugely important to the Florida economy. And if we can't get workers to provide the fruit that prop up that segment of the economy, that's going to that's gonna impact Florida in a pretty big way. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Before we go, we want to share with you what some of you had to say about last night's show on the drama at the Sarasota County School Board. It's been a chaotic few months for the Sarasota School Board members. Members butting heads, undermining text messages coming to light, elected officials openly bashing the superintendent. We went to Facebook to hear your thoughts, and Cindy just says, ridiculous. Cindy uh, says, wow, this is not good. And Belinda says, solution, 
fire them all and start with a fresh group who truly want to put education first. Well, if you'd like to join the conversation on tonight's topic, just visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash mysuncoast.com.abc7. And FYI, you can watch past discussions on demand. They're available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. We want to thank all our guests for being here tonight. Paul Bissett, the Chief Operating Officer at Harvest Crew Robotics, Keith Fitzgerald, Political Science Professor at New College, and Michael Snipes, Economics Instructor at Sarasota, USF Sarasota Manatee.